There we go. And so we will dive right in. So this is the topic of the hour. It probably, it hopefully won't take the entire hour, um, but climate change and vector-borne disease. And so uh, before we get too far uh, diving in, I do just want to mention that the land that I'm presenting from today was previously um, occupied by the Kickapoo, Ho-Chunk, Peoria, Sauk, Sioux, and Miamia tribes. Um, and then thank you very much for the introduction. You're absolutely right. And I'm a pediatrician and I'm a climate medicine advocate. Um, I do not have any financial disclosures or conflicts of interest um, to, uh, to disclose as it relates to this presentation. And so diving into the objectives, here's what I'd like to look at today. Um, I wanna to provide an overview of the complexity that's involved in attribution of climate change impacts to vector-borne illnesses. And there's a lot in there. Um, explain how climate change impacts tick-borne disease through the lens of Lyme disease. So we'll mostly look at Lyme disease um, with tick-borne illness. And then explain how climate change impacts mosquito-borne disease, disease through the lens of dengue virus. So um, any climate and health presentation, um, we would be remiss if we didn't start with this information, which is that, um, you know, when you look at the current state of the climate, um, this just came out last, um, last year, the physical science basis, the assessment um, report five from the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC or Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, this is the, this is the um, multinational or, or international organization that compiles all climate evidence um, in order to draw conclusions. And this report um, is signed off by 195 countries around the globe. And so to have a multiple thousand page report that has been reviewed and certified by um, you know, almost 200 countries to come out and say this phrase right here, which is that it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land. Um, widespread rapid changes in the atmosphere, ocean, cryosphere, and biosphere has been observed. That's a big deal. I mean, saying something is unequivocal, that's very different than saying there is a high degree of evidence for, or we believe that, or there is limited evidence or regional evidence. I mean, this phrase is essentially saying that if you don't believe that climate change is, is caused uh, by humans or that it, that it doesn't exist, you know, that's almost like believing that the earth is flat based on the degree of evidence that we have in this report. So it's just really important to um, state the, the scientific side of this, even though sometimes we feel differently in our, in our own um, spheres around the, around the table at you know, Thanksgiving or other places. And this is why uh, climate change is happening. So there's a natural greenhouse effect, which is normal. This is good for our earth without the greenhouse effect. Um, we wouldn't have a habitable, a habitable earth. Um, the greenhouse gases that are released through natural processes um, essentially form a blanket over our earth. And that blanket makes it habitable. It's like putting that comforter on your bed in the winter time. It makes us feel comfortable. It makes us feel good as we go to sleep at night. However, humans can also produce greenhouse gases. And that's like throwing on a whole bunch more blankets on top of that bed. And so um, instead of having an appropriate amount of uh, solar radiation re-radiated um, back into the atmosphere to keep things habitable, um, a larger amount of heat gets re-radiated back into the atmosphere and it changes how earth functions. And some of the primary functions or effects that we see as a result of climate change on our planet um, so as the name, uh, traditional name of global warming implies, you know, rising temperatures are one of those four changes. Um, and we know that rising temperatures are going to influence things like heat waves. It's going to influence things like droughts. Um, it makes, uh, you know, places like uh, the Western United States, Australia, other regions around the globe um, at higher risk of things like wildfires. Um, and then rising temperatures also influence rising sea levels. So um, not only are we seeing that the land ice is melting and rising sea levels, but we also know that things that are warmer will expand. And so as we warm our water, um, bodies of water around the globe, those will expand just, just based on Boyle's law, based on physics. And then the third component, as you inject more energy into a system, we know that extreme weather is going to be more likely. So um, extreme flooding, extreme precipitation, um, you know, uh, cold waves or winter storms, hurricanes, intensity and frequency, all of these extreme weather events are tied to um, climate change. And then lastly, as we see increases um, specifically in the gas of, of CO2, um, or carbon dioxide, um, just 
going back to high school chemistry, we know that water plus CO2 leads to carbonic acid. And so our oceans, um, even though they're serving to some degree as a buffer for CO2 in the atmosphere as they absorb that CO2, and we also know that absorbing that CO2 is, in, is decreasing the pH or increasing the acidification of our oceans, which um, really can cause um, issues with uh, our, our, um, our ocean ecosystems. And so all of those um, impacts on Earth then translate to human health impacts. And that's mostly what we're here to talk about today. Um, so these central um, components that uh, were sort of addressed on the previous slide um, can then lead to things like extreme heat, severe weather, air pollution, changes in vector ecology, increasing allergens, which can be problems for atopic diseases as seen here, water quality impact, impacts, um, water and food supply impacts, and environmental degradation. Um, this graphic that comes from the Center for Disease Control website um, really then showed these eight other ways that climate change is impacting human health, kind of stemming from the underlying environmental crisis. And I really like to, to phrase things that way. You know, climate change can be difficult for people to see as a human health issue because climate change isn't a disease. What it is, is it's an environmental crisis that is accelerating and amplifying human disease. And so you can see things accelerate and amplify outward. Um, I tend to think of there being about nine different ways that climate change impacts human health, which includes these eight, um, plus just you know um, singling out the, the importance of mental health um, impacts of climate change. However, for the focus of today, this is the area that we're gonna be looking at. So changes in vector ecology. And so the way that we're gonna do that um, is looking at a tick and a mosquito-borne disease. But before we dive into each of those, I do just want to mention that figuring out how to attribute, you know, what, what part of climate change, um, you know, does climate change play a part in vector-borne disease? Um, it's important to recognize how difficult it is to make that attribution um, in this sphere of, of those eight to nine regions of human health issues. And it's for a variety of reasons. Number one, it's complex. Um, when we have vector-borne illnesses, we're looking at multiple hosts. We have the actual insect, we have intermediate hosts, there are definitive hosts. Um, for anyone who's had parasitology classes, kind of thinking back to those, those life cycles can be incredibly complex. They're very regionally specific. Lyme disease is regionally specific. Dengue is regionally specific. Malaria is regionally specific. Um, they're temporarily delayed because we have to go through multiple hosts. Um, disease transmission can be difficult to prove as a result of one component of climate change. Um, and as a result of that lag time between when we're seeing things slowly change with climate and then how we're seeing reporting um, as it goes through, through the different cycles of that disease, um, that can make things a little bit more challenging. And then we also know that vector-borne disease is affected by human activity. And so really factoring out what components are caused by climate change, what components are caused by human activity, um, and by human activity, I mean like how we interface with our environment, not necessarily the greenhouse gases that we're emitting, um, but what, what components of human behavior um, are causing disease rather than you know, um, climate change. And so there are a lot of things that are going on. And I really like how the fourth um, national climate assessment um, puts this. And so you have these exposure pathways and health outcomes that are related to climate drivers with also the recognition of an environmental and institutional context of what's happening with our, um, with, with our built environment, and then also a social and behavioral context of, of the things that um, make up who we are as humans or the choices that we make from day to day. And um, one thing that I, I uh, can't wait to do is to share my favorite parasite because yes, I was a parasitology TA um, in undergrad, and I thought parasites were awesome. Um, and you know, by sharing about Dicrocelium dendriticum, I hope it shows you some of the complexity that we see um, in the parasitology world. And so, Dicrocelium dendriticum, fortunately, it doesn't cause too much human disease, but it is a um, it's a, a liver fluke. Uh, that typically exists in ruminant animals. It causes disease in things like sheep or cows. Um, and so this is the life cycle. Um, so there's an egg that's typically passed in the fecal material of one of the animals. And then a snail, and there are a couple different species of snail, um, will end up ingesting the egg that's passed in the feces. Inside the snail, that egg then hatches into something called a myricidial form um, and goes through a couple different life cycle stages inside the snail. 
eventually this mobile form of this parasite, um, which is called the circarial form, gets left behind in, um, in snail slime. The, the, the technical term for these are actually slime balls. And the slime balls are eaten by ants. So this ant comes along, finds a slime ball, eats it that's infected with circaria, or will bring it back to its, um, I don't know, what do you, what do you uh, the ant den, lair, hive, whatever, wherever ants come, I'm sure there's a, a word for that. Wherever the ants go, it will bring them back. Um, and when they eat it, the circarial stage will eventually insist as something called a metacircaria, where some of it will be in the gut of the ant, but some of it will actually go to the ant's brain and it will change the behavior of this ant where in the nighttime, these ants will climb up to the top of a uh, blade of grass and will hang there, latched on with their mandibles, just hanging there. Like it literally just controls this ant and makes it do that. And then in the morning, as the cows or sheep or other grazing animals come out to, to feed in the pasture, they're eating the grass, but then they also eat these ants that are infected with metacercaria. And then the metacercaria then hatch into larval forms and eventually adult forms within the intestine of that animal. And so, I mean, it's life cycles that like this that really just help me appreciate the complexity of parasitic infections. And it's, it's something that um, is super fascinating, um, but it's also just important to, to think about um, how there are a variety of factors that influence things like parasitic diseases like we'll be going through. Fortunately, nothing quite this complex though. So um, today we're gonna talk about Lyme disease and we're gonna talk about dengue. Um, and so Lyme disease is where we'll start. And so Lyme disease, as um, some of you may know, um, is a bacterial infection caused by Borrelia burgdorferi. And there are a few other um, forms of Borrelia that can cause um, Lyme disease, um, but it's Borrelia species. And it's transmitted by the Ixodes uh, species of ticks. Here in Wisconsin and in New England, it's typically Ixodes scapularis, but Ixodes pacificus in the Western United States. And then we'll see Ixodes ricinus um, in the Northern regions of Europe. Um, can transmit Lyme disease. Um, and there are four different life cycle, or not life cycle stages, there are four different disease stages um, to, um, to Lyme disease. There's early localized disease, which most of us think about with that bullseye rash. Um, there's early disseminated disease, which can sometimes be things like meningitis or um, carditis, like uh, heart disease, uh, joint disease. Um, there's late disease, which is more on the order of um, months to a year after um, the initial infection. And then there's post Lyme disease syndrome, where uh, there is no longer actual borrelial species that can be obtained from serum or through PCR testing or anything like that. It is actually post Lyme or chronic Lyme. This is an actual disease entity. Certainly, it's not as uh, pronounced as a lot of our patients in Wisconsin who have chronic fatigue or other things would, would like to. To say um, say that it exists, um, but it, uh, we do know that Lyme, uh, that Borrelia species do have um, some way of altering host mechanisms so that there can be a chronic Lyme, Lyme state. Um, and one thing that's clear is because there is no actual active infection during this, um, you know, kind of an autoimmune reaction to a previous Lyme infection, um, I do just want to reiterate, um, because there is, you know, controversy in, in some spheres, um, that all of the major medical organizations would say that um, four to six week courses of antibiotics or any attempt at treatment to for even for truly and uh, truly diagnosed chronic Lyme is really not useful at all and that um, only active infections um, are things that should be treated with antibiotics. But those are the different disease stages. Um, and so I do just want to share one of my patients who had Lyme disease. This was a couple of years ago and I had an 11 year old boy um, who showed up to the urgent care a couple times for headache and malaise, just very general symptoms. Um, and he was given uh, information and conservative, you know, and, and instructed to, you know, just have conservative treatment at home. Um, and things didn't really improve. And so they actually gave one of our nurses a call and the nurse said, hey, Andrew, I, th I think it'd be worthwhile that you reach out to this family. So I gave the family a call. And when I was speaking with this patient's dad, he was really naming off a number of conditions that were concerning for meningitis. And so I said, you know, it would really be worthwhile that you go to the ER. Um, in the ER, he was diagnosed, well, he had, a, he had a lumbar puncture and it was eventually diagnosed with Lyme meningitis and he started on IV antibiotics in the hospital. Um, there is a course of a two-week course of doxycycline that you can take 
um, as oral um, outpatient medication. Um, however, unfortunately, this child couldn't tolerate the oral medication because the doxycycline was causing vomiting for him. So he had to get uh, brought back to the hospital where he was sedated so he could have a peripherally inserted central catheter or a pick line placed um, so that he could have a four week course of ceftriaxone, which um, healthcare providers will often know this is an IV antibiotic. So he had to have home health nursing come to, uh, to treat with IV antibiotics for four weeks. And I like to tell the story because I like to remind people that so often we look at mortality as a result of a disease, but we don't necessarily consider morbidity. We don't consider the emotional impacts of disease. We don't um, consider the financial impacts. We don't consider the day-to-day -day stress that a, a story like this on this um, family's 11-year-old child um, would have or the impact on the 11-year-old child itself. Um, and so you can have significant alterations in um, in your life, even if um, we're not looking at numbers for mortality on, on an epidemiological slide. <laughs> so this is what uh, spreads Lyme disease, which is up here, the black-legged tick or Ixodes scapularis. You'll notice that there are three different life cycle stages. I guess technically there's a fourth if you include the egg, um, but the larva, the nymph, and the male or and the adults all look uh, different. And you can even see that there's a difference between the adult female and the adult male stages. Um, same thing with the other ticks, um, Amblyoma American, Americanum and Dermacenter variabilis. Um, these also um, are disease-causing ticks in, in the United States. However, um, Ixodes scapularis or Ixodes species is the only one that's going to cause Lyme disease. You can see that it's also the smallest tick. And to have a better sense of how um, we spread or how Lyme disease spreads, we really have to know more about the life cycle of Borrelia and the life cycle of the tick and kind of that interaction. And so here you can see if you have eggs, um, they're typically laid by um, an adult female in, in the spring and they will hatch. And um, eggs are Borrelia naive. There's no Lyme disease in eggs. There's no transmission from an adult female um, to the eggs. Um, and so when these larvae hatch, um, they are uninfected. Um, typically the first host that a larval, that a larva is going to feed on is going to be a small rodent or it'll be a bird. The white-footed mouse is what I think this is probably a picture of because it's one of the most common hosts um, for larval stages. And so if um, the Lyme disease already exists within these hosts, then the larva can pick it up from, um, from one of these intermediate hosts. Um, but the larva itself, until it takes that first blood meal, which it needs to molt into a nymph, um, is going to be uninfected. So if it picks up Borrelia, if it picks up Lyme from that white-footed mouse, let's say, then it'll overwinter and it'll molt into a nymph. And so now as a nymph, the nymphal stage is going to be the first form that you could actually spread Lyme disease to a human host. Um, now, it doesn't, it doesn't just have the possibility of spreading it to humans, but it can spread it to white-tailed deer, it can spread it to other mammals. But really the point is, is that this nymphal form is going to be the first like life cycle stage that it can spread to adults. I'm sorry, to humans. Um, and so then um, it'll take that blood meal, um, potentially infect uh, humans, and then eventually will molt into an adult form. And then an adult female, in order to uh, produce eggs, will also need a blood meal. Um, and so if that adult female was infected, either because it was already infected as a larva or became infected um, when it took a blood meal as a nymph, um, then uh, as an adult, um, to get that blood meal for, for egg production, um, it can also uh, infect humans or, or other mammals at that stage. And so you can see there's a lot going on in, in order for that tick um, to pick up Borrelia and then for that um, Borrelia then to be transmitted to adults. Or I'm sorry, to humans. They have a picture of adults, so I just keep thinking adults even though <laughs> I'm a pediatrician. Um, but let's look at the and let's look at the epidemiology. So burden of Lyme disease in the United States, it's the most common vector borne illness here in the US with almost 35,000 cases in 2019. Um, and the majority of Lyme disease is going to be from the Atlantic and from the Midwestern states. Um, historically, we would say um, from the Northeastern United States or New England in the Midwestern states, but um, Maryland and Virginia are now among the uh, states that are um, most likely to have uh, reported cases of Lyme disease. So it's now very much a mid-Atlantic region um, disease as well. And so here are some maps over time of uh, disease prevalence with Lyme disease. And so you can see here in 2001, um, you can see a little bit of a spread and range in 2005. Moving forward, you can see 2010 and up to 2019. And you can see there definitely um, 
is a Lyme disease epidemic to some extent with uh, spread and range and, and uh, how, these, how this is being reported. Wisconsin specific, this is Lyme incidence. So this is more of the rate of occurrence over time. Um, not necessarily the prevalence. This is not how many people are infected. This is the rate of infection. Um, so how quickly people are becoming infected. Um, so it compares to the, the endemic rate or like kind of a baseline rate of infection. And you can see from 1990 to 1998, um, the rate of infection was increasing a little bit um, and even more so um, through 2010. And using this uh, same um, uh, infographic, which comes from Dr. Susan Paskowitz at uh, University of Wisconsin Department of Entomology. Um, here in 2016, we can see that um, the incidence does, does continue to increase. Um, this is from the Wisconsin Department of Health Services, which um, you know, shows a, a very similar um, incidence rate as um, what Dr. Paskowitz was providing. Um, and I think it is important to note that we have genomic studies of Braley burgdorferi saying that this is not just a new infectious disease, um, but that Braley has been around for thousands and thousands of years. And um, through genomic diversification studies, we can see that the Lyme epidemic um, is recent and that it has been ecologically driven. So it's not that there was some kind of a, a change in the uh, virulence of the, of the actual bacteria, um, but we know that there are largely ecological factors that are driving this increase in incidence and increase in prevalence of Lyme disease. So how do we know then what's causing it? And is there a role for climate change? And if so, what is that role? And in order to know that, you have to look at um, something called vectorial capacity. Um, a vector is something like the mosquito or the tick. And vectorial capacity is the measure of the capacity for that vector to transmit the pathogen um, to the host. So you have Borrelia, um, the, the bacteria here, we have the human over here. What is the capacity for the tick to take that Borrelia from here and transmit it into the host? That's what vectorial capacity is. And there are a lot of things that can influence that with ticks. First of all, there's something called vector competence. Um, essentially, that's just saying, well, how, how capable is the Ixodes scapularis tick at um, having the uh, Borrelia species go through that um, through that journey inside the vector, right? If you're that larva and you um, ingest the blood meal, you have um, Borrelia bacteria in your gut. How does that get from your gut and journey all the way to your mouth parts and get into the human? Um, the ability for that to occur, that's vector competence. And the higher the competence, the more likely it is to spread disease. Um, there is low vector competence um, for Lyme disease and things like um, the wood tick, which is why we say it's not uh, a vector for disease. Um, intermediate host availability. Um, so for example, we know that that white-footed mouse or other rodents are vectors for, are, are, they can carry disease, they can be intermediate hosts. Um, and so if you have a, an oak, a whole bunch of oak trees and those oak trees master, they have, they shed their acorns every two to three years. We know that there are population booms in rodents after those oak masting years, which makes sense. You have an abundance of acorns. Um, you have this, you know, a whole host of food. And so you increase rodent populations as a result of increases in rodent populations. You could potentially then see improvements in survival rates of the tick and potentially spread of disease. Um, and then you can also see that that can be affected not just by food supplies, things like oak masting, but then also um, habit, uh, habitat migration um, and change. So um, if the tick needs those blood meals from other animals, you know, what is the current um, range of the white-tailed deer? What is the current range of the white-footed mouse? What is the range of those intermediate hosts? And so that's something that's important. So we have to, to keep in mind that vectorial capacity is based on where else that tick is getting its blood meal from and which of those hosts are capable of carrying disease. Um, habitat protection. So a tick can freeze to death. A tick um, is very sensitive to desiccation, which is fancy you speak for drying out. Um, and so Ticks typically need to live in these uh, very wooded areas or in places that have thick, tall grasses because um, the kind of the top layer of soil and leaves and grass, that's called the duff layer. 
Um, and it provides a, a good solid barrier for ticks to really burrow in and it, and it escapes, um, you know, really dry, um, arid environments being in that nice moist layer. Um, and then it also can be, you know, negative 20 degrees outside. Um, but if they're kind of in that duff layer, um, it really protects them from freezing. Um, and then not only just protection, but habitat promotion. We know with certain ranges of temperatures that ticks are going to be um, more able to quest, which is get a blood meal or more able to reproduce. And then definitive host availability, right? These first few we're talking about the ability of the, of the bacteria to get into the tick, but how about the ability for the tick to then, or not the tick, the, the bacteria to get from the tick into the human. Um, and that will be influenced not only by this questing behavior and reproductive behavior, but also human behavior and the human interface with tick habitat. What are the things that we're doing or the way that we're preventing disease? So there's a lot going on. When we think about what components are affected by climate change, these are some of the things that can really influence that. And I'll go through some of those a little more specifically here in this next slide. So tick habitat and climate change. We know that um, as climate change increases temperatures, we're seeing milder winters. And so with milder winters, we're we see decreases in tick mortality. So um, for example, in order to have, um, if you were to expose these ticks for eight hours um, at these temperatures, it would, typically produce a 50% mortality. So if you're a fed larva, um, if you are in 12.5 degrees Fahrenheit temperatures for eight hours, 50% of you are going to die um, as a result of freezing. And so if we don't have as many lower temperatures, then we are going to find that the mortality rate will decrease for these ticks. Um, milder winters on the flip side, um, are also going to increase times for ticks to actively search for a blood meal. So if winter is functionally shorter um, because temperatures are milder, then that means that the effective screen, uh, screen time, uh, effective spring time for that tick starts sooner and the effective start to winter gets pushed back later, which is a longer time frame during which those ticks can get blood meals, during which those ticks can reproduce um, and improve the survivability of the ticks and improve the survivability um, of offspring. And then um, that being said, I, I do want people to know that there are high temperature limits, but the critical temperature for death to occur for the Ixodes scapularis tick um, is typically around 104 degrees Fahrenheit. This wouldn't be the same for Ixodes um, ricinus, which would be seen in Northern Europe, but for, for all intents and purposes within the United States, this is really that number that we're looking for. Um, and even if we do see heat indices of 104 degrees Fahrenheit, um, most ticks are going to dive down into that duff layer that we were talking about before, and again, have protection from the elements. So these would have to be usually sustained temperatures of 104 or above um, for extended periods of time. Um, and it's very clear that um, at least in, in this region of the United States, and as we look at um, north of us, um, that these milder winters are playing a larger factor than the higher temperature limits that we're exceeding. And so um, given the information that I just shed, um, when we look at this uh, infographic, which comes from uh, chapter 11 of the IPCC um, report, um, uh, the, the fourth assessment report, um, and this is the chapter on, on human health. Um, down here, tick-borne diseases with Lyme disease. Um, you can see this is a little bit of an, of an older uh, report. Um, it's assessment report four. Um, but as, as early as then, we saw that with increases in temperature, that's what this um, greater than sign, um, we see a higher incidence of disease. Um, and with uh, increases in humidity, this is the symbol for humidity, um, we also see more cases. And I'm sorry, I shouldn't say incidence, higher prevalence, and this is a higher prevalence. Um, this uh, blue is referencing lower confidence, and that lower confidence is um, just reflective of the fact that that vectorial capacity is, is difficult to measure, and it recognizes that climate change is not the sole driver um, for spread of Lyme disease. Um, now, that being said, let's, let's talk about those intermediate hosts and what we do know. Well, um, we know that Paramiscus leucopus, this is the white-footed mouse that I was referring to earlier. Um, one study showed that between 1970 and 2010, that the estimated expansion in southern Quebec was about 10 kilometers per year over that 40-year period. Um, over, this, uh, over a similar time frame um, in Michigan, there was observed expansion of about 15 kilometers per year over a 30-year period. 
Um, and then there was uh, climate modeling that was done in Quebec um, with baselines around 2013 that looked um, up to 2050. And the estimated expansion from that climate model in, Qu in Quebec showed that the white-footed mouse was likely to have an additional northern shift of about 250 kilometers over 40 years. So that intermediate host factor um, is, is definitely, we're seeing some amplification of that in northern climates where um, previously the white-footed mouse or the, the tick may not have been able to live. And then what follows as intermediate hosts um, logically is going to be those um, tick species who feed on them. And so Canadian expansion, um, um, one study showed an expected shift northward of up to 300 kilometers by 2050. Um, and there was a, a Swedish um, a survey, a Swedish survey that was conducted showing northern expansion between 1980 and 2000. So we are starting to see some of that northern expansion of the Exodes tick itself as well. Um, and then this study, the next study um, was a study that was done in New Brunswick. So you can see this is the region of New Brunswick for people who are a little bit uh, rusty on um, their Canadian geography. So just, uh, um, just right next to Maine um, near Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island. And what the study did was they looked at the probability of occurrence um, for canine Lyme disease. So this was a, um, this was looking at Lyme disease in dogs and they compiled a baseline um, of canine Lyme disease um, around 2013 to, to 2014. And you can see that the um, more, the, the redder that things get, the higher the probability for canine Lyme disease to occur. And then using um, climate modeling data, they said, well, let's see how this is going to change over time. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with climate modeling, we'll typically look at a variety of scenarios, right? We'll say, if we do business as usual and we continue to increase our energy expenditure and we do not decrease our greenhouse gas emissions, we just continue to rely on traditional fossil fuel sources or other sources, um, that would be one scenario. And how is that going to impact a certain um, climate projection? And then we might say, well, what if we stopped emissions and kept emissions at the exact same rate? Or what happens if we decrease emissions? And those different categories of decreasing emissions, neutral emissions, um, increasing emissions, those are reflected in something that is called an RCP. Um, so this RCP um, 4.5 climate projection, this is essentially if we took the baseline greenhouse gas emissions from 2014 to 2016, and we kept it right where that is, and we did not increase greenhouse gas emissions at all, which we know now is not true because we've actually increased emissions um, over the last, what would that be? Uh, six years. I'm doing my math right, six to eight years. Um, RCP 8.5, this would be business as usual. We're going to continue greenhouse gas emission increases um, consistent with increases in energy expenditures. And so this is the RCP projection in the 2020s um, for the um, incidence of canine Lyme disease. And you can see um, that it's definitely worse than the um, initial baseline that we have in that first slide. So going back to 2020s. Here's probability of currents, um, RCP 8.5 still here, RCP 4.5 here um, in the 2050s. And then here's probability of occurrence in the 2080s. Um, and this is based on those climatic factors alone, um, controlling for the other factors. And so this is a, a pretty dramatic increase and um, hard to deny that increase in range. And so some of the take home points I want to make for Lyme disease is that one, Lyme disease is a significant cause of um, mild to severe disease, um, that Lyme disease incidence and prevalence is increasing, and that tick hosts that harbor Borrelia species are confined by climatic factors, especially temperature and humidity. Um, and that as global temperatures warm, that northward expansion of ticks is expected. Um, and that's partly due to the fact that as global temperatures warm, northward expansion, expansion of tick hosts is expected. And then Lyme transmission is increasing with warmer temperatures and humidity. Um, however, due to the complexity, um, we know that uh, climate change alone is not the sole, um, is not the sole driver of that. Um, so there, it, it is a, a lower confidence than we see with some other vector-borne illnesses. So um, we'll be moving on to dengue next, but let me just pause, give everybody a chance to take a breath because I know that's relatively technical. Um, and then just ask, does anyone have any questions at this point? So mm -hmm. 
Andrew, you may jump into this later, but in thinking about what we understand um, from a patient population, knowing this in the background, which you articulated very well for us, how do we wanna take that forward to support patients to try and alleviate higher risk and or just better awareness? Yeah, absolutely. So there are a lot of ways that we can incorporate um, climate change into the counseling that we provide to patients. Um, that may be unique to each doctor. Um, however, you know, when it comes to, to things like um, insect-borne diseases um, or any other kind of environmental um, environmental condition, you know, medical conditions that are caused by environmental disease, to me, it's all kind of the same, right? I have patients who I counsel about using sunscreen. Um, because, you know, during those summer months when the sun is most intense, you're more likely to have burns or have cumulative sun exposure that results in skin cancer. And people recognize that. Likewise, it's pretty natural to let people know that uh, Lyme disease exists in Wisconsin. And we can talk about how the incidence is prevalent and prevalence of Lyme disease is increasing in the state of Wisconsin um, due to a number of factors. And you can let them know that part of that's due to climate change. Um, and it's not about um, anything that's politically polarizing, and it's just letting people know the facts of what exists and the information that we have. And so while you're counseling them about making sure that you're using um, uh, an insect repellent that's effective against both mosquitoes and ticks, um, letting them know that uh, if there are ways that um, you can save energy or support clean energy initiatives, that um, if that's done on a global basis, uh, that it could potentially um, help with decreasing, you know, mitigating the effects of climate change or adapting to climate change. That's an important discussion to have in your clinic. And I think it's a, and I have found personally that it's a discussion that you can have in a very risk-free way, um, given that it's just your medical recommendation. Great. So um, let's move on to dengue. So, um, Dengue, this is a virus. It's transmitted by mosquitoes. Um, we know that the Aedes species of mosquitoes, so typically Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, those are the two, um, the two mosquitoes that transmit um, dengue virus. Um, they also transmit Zika, chikungunya viruses, some other arboviruses, um, but there's a much greater um, population at risk. So 4 billion people at risk around the globe, about one in four of the people who are infected with dengue will actually go on to get sick. Um, and about one in 20 of the people who get sick with dengue will develop severe disease um, with infants and pregnant women being disproportionately affected um, by dengue virus. Um, what, what it typically looks like. So nausea, vomiting, rash, but the aches and pains are very characteristic of this disease. Um, pain, especially behind the eye and musculoskeletal pain um, is, uh, can be pretty substantial with dengue virus. Um, and the symptoms typically are short-lived, fortunately. Um, however, severe dengue can be life-threatening within a few hours um, with uh, common manifestations of severe dengue being shock, internal bleeding and death. Um, and unfortunately, there isn't much natural immunity that's conferred by infection. Um, and in fact, if you've had dengue in the past, you're actually more likely to develop severe disease um, in the future. And so um, transmission of dengue is a little bit, is, is pretty different from transmission of Lyme disease. So first of all, we know that it's a mosquito, but the mosquito itself um, it doesn't need blood meals, multiple blood meals to go through multiple life cycles. Um, there's a blood meal that the adult female needs in order to lay eggs, but then going from an egg to a larva to a pupa to an adult does not require any blood meals at all. And so really the only time that blood meals are taken is um, between when the adult female takes it in order to, to lay eggs. Now, that being said, um, the, the tick took one blood meal and then went to the next life cycle stage. Whereas the mosquito will take multiple blood meals um, during this um, gonotrophic cycle um, before it can deposit those eggs. Um, and so it's just important to not to lose sight of the, the fact that their behaviors are different um, and that will influence um, the, the change in, in how it amplifies uh, disease. Um, and so again, going back to that term again, vectorial capacity, um, so vectorial capacity for the uh, mosquito is somewhat similar, right? There's the vector competence, meaning how well can the virus go from the, uh, 
Um, it's called the mes mesenteron, which is kind of the, the gut of the mosquito all the way up to the salivary glands because it's then transmitted from the salivary glands down through the proboscis and into the human. Um, you know, that vector competence is something that's important to consider. Um, the population density, right? So how many mosquitoes are there per host? There are a number. So the vector competence, that's, that's these intrinsic factors. Population density, that's going to be an extrinsic factor. Um, other extrinsic factors include blood feeding behavior. Um, and we know that blood feeding behavior. So first of all, for the 80s mosquitoes, um, they tend to be some of the more aggressive mosquitoes and they prefer to feed on humans, um, which isn't really great when it comes to the, the, the spread of disease. Um, but we know that they can be impacted by temperature, um, by rainfall, through land use practices, um, because all of these factors are going to put us uh, in, in, greater, um, in greater proximity to disease carrying mosquitoes. Um, but the reason lane, um, rainfall and temperature and other, other things play a role has to do with the life cycle. So um, the eggs that the mosquito deposits or that, that they oviposit, that they lay, um, they typically need to be near calm standing water. Now that calm standing water can be a pond, it can be a puddle, it can be something natural, but it can also be a stack of old thrown out tires. It can be um, a, a rainwater cistern. It can be a lot of different places. And then under the right uh, temperatures and under the right barometric pressure, that's where eventually it'll hatch into an adult. Um, and so um, we definitely know that the extrinsic factors will perpetuate the ability of the, the mosquito to replicate. And so you um, we know that um, that if they're surviving more, um, that you increase the potential for disease. And then vector longevity, right? How long is this mosquito going to live? I mean, that also plays a, a, a significant role, understandably, because they take multiple blood meals um, um, in their lifetime, not necessarily just as they um, progress between life cycle stages. And so because it's a little bit easier to track what happens um, with mosquitoes, there's a lot less, um, there's a lot more confidence when we're looking at that vectorial capacity. And so from the Lancet countdown in 2018, um, we saw that if you were to look at vectorial capacity, um, the baseline uh, in the 1950s, um, using the 1950s as a baseline, from 1950, we've just seen an increase in vectorial capacity for both the 80s aegypti and 80s albopictus mosquito, um, you know, 7.8%, 9.6%. And then the model projections just show that as greenhouse gas emissions will con continue to increase, that we're going to continue to see a rise in vectorial capacity. And then naturally one would um, extrapolate that if you have an increase in vectorial capacity, you're going to have an increase in disease. Um, without any other adaptation measures, things like, you know, netting or insect repellent, et cetera. But the mosquito will continue to be good at transmitting disease or better. Um, going back to that uh, slide that we saw for Lyme disease, that was the data that we looked at down here where we saw that temperature and humidity um, are likely to cause uh, more disease as those increase. Here with dengue, we can see, first of all, the disease burden is much higher. Um, and then uh, the factors that affect it are a little bit different. So studies that we have here show that with, um, this is the temperature symbol. So with increases in temperature, we see more disease. With increases in precipitation, we see more disease. Um, conversely, decreases in temperature, decreases in precipitation um, show less disease. And then with humidity, um, unlike with Lyme disease, humidity with increases in humidity, we actually see um, some positive effects and some negative effects. This really points to regional variation. And so you can't really correlate, um, have a global correlation um, to humidity. Um, but I do want to point out with dengue, we definitely have a high confidence in global effect with these increases in temperature and increases in precipitation. Um, now, I know that a lot of people are thinking, well, you know, dengue isn't really present in the United States. Um, and I want to make sure that people are aware that what happens globally does matter for US citizens. So first of all, there is a direct disease burden on military personnel living abroad. There's a direct disease burden on foreign service offer officers. And then we may also have translational evidence that dengue will become more of an issue in the United States. We saw that in 2014 to 2016, around the same time that there was the, um, the Zika virus outbreak um, where warmer conditions, and I know that that was um, looking more at um, 
uh, climate variability due to things like El Nino, um, but with those warmer conditions, Zika transmission was more ripe in places like Florida, Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, and Texas. And so there is concern that we'll continue to, to as we continue to see that expansion um, of the Aedes mosquito um, habitat, that dengue can, could become more of an issue for the United States directly, not just people living abroad. And then it's important to consider indirect disease effects. There are lots of downstream effects as a result of us having a globalized society. So even if it's not affecting us to a high degree in the United States, how is amplification of dengue affecting foreign government operations? Um, what resources do they need to put towards um, you know, the health of their populations? And then as a result of that, if there are major issues, um, will there be a, you know, destabilization in those regions that will require the United States to help provide aid, whether it's health aid or monetary aid, research dollars, um, we know that there's a lot of push-pull economics when it comes to things like vaccine creation. And um, uh, more recently, we have seen the creation of a vaccine for dengue. Um, and so what bearing will that have on what the United States um, is expected to provide or capable of provide a, to, to provide abroad? So I just want to make sure that people don't lose sight that just because this isn't like Lyme disease, which we know is very centered in Wisconsin, doesn't mean that it's not having impacts on us. And so take home points for dengue is that it is a significant cause of severe disease across the globe, um, that the vectorial capacity for dengue is increasing globally due to climate change, and that's with a high confidence. And then we do have translational evidence that as vectorial capacity for dengue increases, that the threat to the United States also increases. And so overall conclusions for the whole presentation, one is that one, climate change is caused by humans and mitigation and adaptation is possible with immediate coordinated global action. Um, but you know, I always like to remind people that you don't have to wait for the rest of the world to, to act before, before you do. Um, you know, take care of your own piece of the pie and make sure that people are talking about it for the threat that it is. Um, second is that increases in transmission or severity of vector-borne illness is complex. And we can't solely attribute vector-borne illness to any one factor, but it's um, multifactorial, but it does include climate change. Um, and we see that. So as climate change increases temperature and humidity, that vectorial capacity for tick-borne illnesses like Lyme disease will continue to increase. And that as climate change increases precipitation and temperature, um, that vectorial capacity for mosquito-borne illnesses, illnesses like dengue will continue to increase. Um, so here are my references, and I will just put up this 